appreciate everybody for being here, South Dakota, for being here. I love this relationship we've got going uh, between the metallurgy departments and willing to expand to other departments. Um, our, our speaker today is Mark Levere. Mark uh, comes to us from a variety of companies, but lately he is out consulting on his own. Um, and he happens to be a good friend of uh, Bev Hartline now, and he is now on the uh, board for camp with Ron White and, and what have you. So he's here to speak to us about critical elements and materials, and I'm just going to leave it to go with that. Thank you again. Dr. Cook, are you getting our content? Yes, we are, Kathy. Okay. Thank you. All right, well, we'll get going. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Courtney. Uh, today, I want to focus on critical elements and materials. There's been a lot of uh, discussion in the, in the press about this uh, over the last few years. And uh, oops, there we go. So let's just talk quickly about what makes a, an element critical. The importance, one of the, one of the factors is the importance of that element to clean energy, alternative energy, from a DOE perspective. It's also about security of the country and the needs of the military, and that gives you a DOD perspective. And there's a lot of research that's been floating around, uh, research grants from both of these agencies. An element can also, the criticality of that element is also related to the supply risk. Can this material be obtained directly um, without being held hostage to price? Is there a monopoly of supply by one region, one country? And also, does that shortage, potential shortage, create a threat to society in terms of the quality of living, the, the values of uh, the, the comfort of living that that society has? If we go back in time, before World War II, there were industrial metals, and the industrial metals were really steel, iron, copper, your, your base metals, and then there were minor metals. And World War II, the advent of World War II, really drove the transition of minor metals to technology metals. And what happened there was economic limitations were put aside in favor of innovation and a race to gain the upper hand, to gain advantage. Uh, national security really became the driver, and everything was top secret military. And some of these things that were going on at that time were development of jet engines, rocket engines, and guidance systems. Uh, communications, radar, uh, and electronic computing. Uh, after World War II and, and further into the Korean War, the Cold War ensued. But during that time, overproduction, and we'll see this later, the overproduction of technology metals continued. That means there really wasn't a lot of demand, there weren't a lot of applications, but there's a lot of experimentation, a lot of uh, research and development looking forward. Some of it was really very secretive. Um, but this surplus, so this surplus occurs, and this surplus was diverted to the civilian consumer use. And so now private companies are now able to get their hands on these materials and, and uh, understand the uses and, and how can we now put that to, to work for the general public. And this really was the planting of the seeds of the, of the new age of technology, uh, getting out of the industrial revolution and into the technology. Uh, space, technology revolution. We became very dependent on these technology metals uh, for mass, produce, uh, mass production of the consumer goods, and some of these consumer goods were the miniaturized electronics that we all enjoy, and, and that has continued to miniaturize. Miniaturized looked this big when I was a kid, and today it looks this big. And uh, large-scale television, uh, personal communications, computers, uh, so you can see where some of this criticality is coming. If I walk over and take away your iPhone from you, you just lost rare earths. Okay, you lost these critical elements and the personal computers. Uh, we also remain dependent on these technology metals for national security, the, the weapons guidance system, the very high precision uh, um, uh, targeting of, of uh, uh, with minimal collateral damage. Uh, that, that we see on TV from time to time, surveillance, and uh, who would have thought you could have watched uh, the taking down of Osama bin Laden from the west wing of the White House uh, while in, in live time, uh, which really gives battlefield superiority. But the bulk of these metals are today used for civilian production 
and the military has quite simply become just another customer who uh, really doesn't catalyze the, uh, the supply or have a uh, priority position. Just to emphasize these technology metals, a uh, quote from a couple of guys uh, recognized in the industry as experts, Gareth Hatch and Jack Lifton. Um, technology metals are those generally rare metals that are essential for the production of high-tech devices and engineered systems. So with that in mind, if we look at rare metals then, these technology metals, are usually defined as annual production less than 25,000 tons. And uh, we've, I've listed some of these rare metals, and obviously some of them are above 25,000 tons, but they, they still fall in the category. And the ones highlighted in red are the ones that I'm going to focus on today, which are uh, the rare earth uh, metals. Now, we, we know that we can go out and mine uranium, process uranium, silver, gold, uh, cobalt, but these rare earth metals are really, uh, as opposed to being mined uh, in base or common metals, the rare earth metals are mined as a group of elements. They're not mined individually. I can't go out and mine individually lanthanum or disprosium. There are 15 some elements in that lanthanide series that, that are mined as a rare earth deposit. And byproduct rare earths are produced, but the production of those rare earths are fairly limited as a byproduct. You know, rare earth is really a, a misnomer because these rare earth elements occur in, in the crustal earth in some measurable quantity. But what is rare is to find those deposits where there's a high concentration of, of these 15 elements, uh, yeah, 2 percent or 15 percent or whatever. Uh, the key supply issue then becomes the complex metallurgy that's required in order to extract those elements out of the uh, mined material. And that's just the beginning. And, and we'll talk a little bit, but you go through some pretty torturous uh, processes in order to extract these elements uh, into solution in a hydrometallurgical complex. And then we have to find a way to separate those 15 elements. I'm sorry to tell you that not all 15 elements are very valuable. <laughs> and there's only five of them that really have primary economic drivers. There's a lot of uses for, for some of the others, and, and four or five of them just quite frankly have minimal application uh, in today's world. The, uh, the problem becomes there's less than five facilities outside of China where those elements can be separated commercially. Quite frankly, I can think of two, and those are, those are the larger viable ones uh, that are outside of China. And then this rare earth oxide that you've made and you've separated, like neodymium or disposium, has to be converted to metal in order to be able to turn that into an alloy. And the ability to do that outside of China is very restricted. Uh, I, can, I can think of only a couple of places, two, three places outside of China that actually do that. Um, and I'm not including Russia in that. Now, Russia has their own unique uh, things that they do, and they don't talk too much about it. Additionally, if you think about these 15 elements, and we start talking about rare earths and the quantity, <laughs> in extracting them, the, the important ones, as you'll see later, the critical ones, the neodymium and, and disposium, as you'll see later, lanthanum and cerium, if you add them together in the distribution, typically account for over 60% of the total rare earth that we're measuring. So it doesn't leave much space for the production of, of the critical ones that we want to get our hands on. So if we talk about assessment of criticality just briefly, the National Academy of Sciences put together a, a scheme for looking at uh, criticality. And basically, they looked on the vertical axis of the impact of supply restriction. What if somebody choked off that restriction and didn't give it to uh, that supply? What if they didn't give it to you? It just made it impossible to get. And then on the x-axis, they looked at supply risk. In other words, if I can't get that material, can I replace it with something else? So. The, the critic, if those 
elements ended up in this area up here, that's where they were critical. Down here is more non-critical. So they looked at the rare earth criticality and the yellow bubble indicates the composite of these different, four different uh, type of applications of rare earths. And you can see the criticality was fairly, is very high on these emission controls, magnets, electronics, and overall rare earths had a criticality that was, that was fairly high. And they basically assigned a, a very high risk to all of them because there were no substitutes at the time they were doing this, this assessment. There was no uh, substitutes or alternatives to that. So they went one step further and, and DOE in 2010 produced a report on critical elements, a lot of it, which is the basis for this talk. It was, a, it was an excellent report. It was followed up and amended in 2011. <clears throat> Excuse me. And these, these are the elements then that came out in the critical area. And this is uh, dysprosium, europium, neodymium, terbium, and yttrium on a short-term basis. They looked over the, first, over the next five years. They then projected that into the, a five to 15 year space and they got more concerned about this, uh, about these rare earth elements. And you can see the indium <coughs> moved over. And today, this is still very true. Uh, yttrium has probably moved over in this area. If some of these projects go into production, if there's no projects go into production, we're still in this, in this area. This is uh, a period, well, the periodic table of elements taken from a, um, a Department of Energy report. But you can see how they're looking at criticality of elements. There's quite a few here, but the one, the new materials are the ones which are considered very critical. Um, they cut the lanthanide series off here and lutetium up here, 71 actually, uh, is considered a rare earth, as well as yttrium, which has similar properties um, and characteristics, which is included uh, in that. Promethium is, does not occur naturally in, in uh, nature, so we don't uh, count it in that rare earth series. There are some milestones that, are, you know, you're talking about rare earth history from uh, 1787 with the initial discovery. And if you look at the timeline from that 1788 and in the initial discovery in basnesite minerals, but what's interesting is to come over here and we talk about World War II and the first industrialization and we're looking at uh, these developing applications, which is that World War II and Cold War era and then this is the era where we start turning it over to the consumers and making it available there. And now it's becoming more important. It's becoming more critical. Why? Because it's in your TV, okay? And if, and if uh, you can't get it, then uh, there goes color TV. But the, the big, the big uh, area of importance here are these magnets, these rare earth magnets and the development of uh, samarium cobalt magnets and uh, neodymium iron boron magnets. And you can see that's all occurring out in here in about 19, well, that's 85, is when that commercialized. Uh, there were some other developments in that uh, in later in the century, that same century. But the, the big thing here is Molly Corp opens Mountain Pass Mine in California, right on the Nevada-California border, targeting Europium for newly developed color TV screens. But as we all know, Many of the other elements came along and became more important, uh, such as the uh, neodymium for, for the rare earth magnets. And then the other thing to take away from here is, is that this, uh, there were a number of Japanese producers who emerged uh, focused on high technology applications. And all of the developments in magnets, phosphors, lasers, this laser itself, uh, catalysts, are all incorporated and depend on separated rare earths in order to make those products. And if you look at the timeline on a processing timeline and the development of improved processing from sulfuric acid treatment all the way down to um, Molycorp's development of calcination and the use of uh, hydrochloric acid for basnesite, 
If you look on the bottom down here and you look at other production and United States production in this, this time frame up to 1980, you know, the United States uh, has become uh, a leader uh, in rare earths. Uh, Bureau, Bureau of Mines in uh, Ames, Iowa uh, Research Lab, uh, Battelle, all of this R&D work has provided benefits and dividends. Um, then we thought the extraction. Now if we talk about the separation, you see a similar line uh, along those years. And again, the, the use of ion exchange for ultra purification, but also solvent extraction for the individual separation of those, of those elements. And again, this, this production here where the United States is in, in, uh, in the lead, one of the leaders. Before that, a lot of this, all of this work and the leader in this was uh, the UK. Uh, Johnson Matthew was actually one of the one of the primary leaders. You want to know where China got all their technology for separation? It came right out of Johnson Matthew. But then, as we move forward, the Chinese began production of oxides for these elements too, as as they need to get resource material in order to produce these end products that consumers want. And uh, the United States continued to have some growth in this area, but then. In the 1990s, China came online. Uh, they had done a, a magnificent job of continuing to develop technology, improve technology, and, uh, and put money into, into uh, natural resource development. Um, and they became the leader very quickly. Um, if you talk to some of the guys, the guys that used to work out at Mountain Pass and people in this industry, they'll tell you the Chinese started dumping in this in this uh, market and with, with no restriction uh, from any of the governments and they basically took over the market and you can see where that production has, has grown uh, over the years um, to the point that uh, probably 2013 or about 2013 I think we, 14 we hit 150,000 uh, metric tons of total rare earth oxide materials consumed per, per year. Now, this is a small market, so we want to keep that in perspective. Uh, this is not like copper or steel. Uh, 150,000 tons is nothing, but remember, everything in these, in these rare earths, these critical elements, are used in milligrams in application. And, uh, but they become very essential uh, in order to make that work. This is uh, uh, the Industrial Mineral Council of Australia. Um, applications uh, in 2010 world and, and the US and uh, the, watch this number right here on magnets okay we're very low in 2010 uh, this is fairly high uh, and this is one of the biggest growth potentials these are the econ this is really the economic driver and it was pro this is a projection from 2011 and I think this is uh, has hit target <clears throat> from talking to some analyst friends of mine but this is, this is going to continue to grow. This is where the opportunity is at. So let's look at some of those applications. Um, <clears throat> your hybrid cars uh, and more than just hybrid uh, electric vehicles. Um, look, at, look at these critical elements that are showing up. Praseodymium, neodymium, dysprosium, and terbium on motors and generators. And in this car, there are 25 plus electric motors these are, these are rare earth magnet motors that have extremely high power to them. And so this is where the criticality comes in clean energy. Clean energy is, is solar power, wind power, but it's also uh, electric vehicles, okay? And you can see the other uses for the batteries and whatnot, but these are the ones that keep repeating themselves. <clears throat> these are essential to make these LCD screens but uh, again, these are the ones that are uh, bigger demand. The average car today, forget a hybrid, just go out and get in your pickup truck, Tom, and, and the average car today has over 125 magnets in it somewhere, okay? Every time you move your seat forward and backwards, magnets, little magnet motors. Uh, roll the windows up and down, magnet motors. This is how we've been able to lighten up vehicles. And when you took, the, when you took a uh, uh, 
power steering pump off, you used to have to be a real man to take it off. And today, you can probably take it off in one hand, right? And uh, these are, this is the, the miniaturization, uh, the micro electronics and, and micronization of everything. And we talk about wind turbine farms. I couldn't get a good cutaway section that I like, but understand that these drives contain <clears throat> a lot of rare, you know, these are the rare earth magnets, the iron, the neodym, yeah, the iron neodymium boron magnets. And they also, these magnets have other composition specifications such as addition and out, uh, to alloy with dysprosium and, and, and sometimes terbium uh, for heat dissipation to extend the life of those magnets. Uh, it's estimated that on these direct drive um, motors for these wind turbines that uh, there's somewhere between 600 to 1,000 kilos of, of uh, uh, rare, rare earth uh, alloy materials. Here's some applications, summations uh, by category, magnetics, phosphors, I won't read them all to you, but you can, you can see medical in imaging there. Uh, MRI, anybody had an MRI or a CAT scan? This is, this is what you're into, okay? Communication systems, of course, the advancement during the Cold War of satellites and, and uh, being able to uh, survey, you know, surveil and whatnot. Uh, that also led to uh, uh, cell phones and uh, our communication uh, comforts of life we have today. Um, fiber optics, another big one. Uh, these are all the things that go away if we don't have these critical elements. Uh, metal alloys, batteries, um, catalyst, of course, uh, there's uh, cracking goes on in the uh, cracking towers in the uh, petroleum refining, fuel additives, uh, air pollution controls. Uh, it would add uh, water treatment. Uh, cerium has uh, playing a bigger role in water treatment cleanup these days, and water, of course, is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. Um, defense, uh, of course, uh, guidance systems, smart missiles, uh, your cruise missiles, things of this sort, satellite communications. And then ceramics. Ceramics are another big, big player. And this is where yttrium comes into a bigger uh, uh, importance uh, in that area, refractories. And glass and polishing. A lot of polishing, uh, these powders of rare earths are, are used in, in polishing powders to get those uh, extremely big uh, microscopes uh, that they use for surveillance or on the Hubble uh, spacecraft that's looking out into space and shooting all these images. So just, I think, you know, we've covered some of the criticality and why it's uh, critical, the, the products that you don't really think about where these materials are at. So where's it come from? Well, China recognized a long time ago the importance of uh, rare earths. And uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping was quoted as saying, there's oil in the Middle East and in China we have rare earths. And uh, the subsequent president to him uh, noted that you improve the development and applications of rare earth and you change the resource advantage into economic superiority. I wanted to throw in this, this outline of China and each of these bubbles, the size indicates production value, uh, volume from a various uh, region. Uh, and you can see that I cannot take a country outside of China uh, and put that map up there and show you rare earth production. It doesn't exist in Canada and it does not exist in the United States. Molly Corp filed for chapter 11 and they're selling their assets. I think they're going into chapter 13 so Mountain Pass is back down and, and there's no production coming out of there. Um, so in the world, this is, this is the leader. And each of these bubbles represent, as I said, production volume but note all of these bubbles down here in these provinces that represent ion absorption, absorption clays. And if you move them together, and there's a couple dark ones in there, the, uh, the monazite, but if you look at these ion absorption clays, these are the easy ones. These are the premier, and they're just loaded with heavy rare earths, uh, terbium and dysprosium, um, and, the, and yttrium, and they basically uh, can in situ leach these clays by pumping uh, something as simple as ammonium nitrate. And farmers are doing this illegally and producing, and then they recover it in a, in a trench and take the solution and uh, they treat the solution to pull the, the rare earths out, precipitate it, 
and uh, it's as simple as that. These are more hard rock operations, but this is where uh, a very large portion of the rare earths are being produced and a lot of your separation facilities, a lot of your uh, metal uh, manufacturing uh, facilities are down in these regions. 97% of the global supply originates from China. Now this number has fluctuated down over the last couple of years. I chose to leave it at 97% because Linus has, uh, although their Mount Weld uh, mine has uh, come online and they are separating in Malaysia, they haven't made much of a dent in this world supply. They have struggled with their startup and um, they're, they're, they're surviving, they're getting their, their uh, uh, costs down. But uh, Molly Corp has failed and, and gone out of business. There are uh, some recycling contributions now that are affecting this number, but it's still well over 90%. The Chinese have a strong geological advantage. 36% um, of the global resource in rare earths is located in China. Uh, and they've had this 50 year run of significant investment in the technology of rare earths. And the separation technology, when we shut down Mountain Pass, we lost a lot of that technology and the research and advancement of that technology for separation efficiency and cost efficiency was lost. As well as the plant capacity to do that separation is all in China. Um, in fact, the Chinese, if they think they're going to need something built, they build it, even if it doesn't get occupied. And right now, the word is from a number of analysts that they believe that they probably have 200 times the current supply. In other words, 200 times the annual production that needs separated, they've got that capacity. This is how it gets tough to compete. Prolonged period, and they've, they've done this providing these materials uh, for a prolonged period of time at very low prices. There are consequences, and one of them is the environmental impact of rare earth processing. Um, China has traditionally operated with little environmental uh, regard. Uh, they are working on that, but there were significant levels of illegal unlicensed processing going on, as I told you, with the in situ leaching and, and uh, the water tables have been contaminated. Uh, the variable levels of environmental control uh, within permanent operations uh, is has had an impact. The other thing that comes along with uh, rare earths are radioactive elements such as radium, uranium, and thorium, particularly thorium. And so these become waste products and they're left about with uh, no, no care and so this has become a problem. Um, I recently was uh, CEO of a company that had a deposit in South Africa that we were working to develop and it was a thorium mine. In, from about 1954 to 1963. Anglo developed it and they were providing thorium for testing and research, gas mantles and things like that. And uh, when they were done, they walked away. The rare earths had no value at that time. They were not in a place where they pr provided any value. They looked at it, but uh, they walked away and the tailings were left to wash away and do what, and blow away or do whatever. So part of our, um, when we acquired that property, part of our promise was to clean it up, which we did. Um, but uh, we were running 7% uh, thorium uh, in the resource, pretty high and very radioactive. And this creates a significant issue in if you're trying to permit a mine and an operation in the rest of the world outside of China. And, and again, if we have to compete with China, we have to be cost effective. Um, China's new approach, uh, they had a significant incident in the Yellow River uh, back in 2007. They've had additional incidents since and there was a number of reports, 60 Minutes did a report on recycling of computers that end up in, in China and they're just openly using strong oxidants such as hydrochloric acid and sulfuric acid to uh, pull this stuff out. Uh, I mean, to pull out uh, the metals of value, be it uh, gold or whatever, and uh, the rivers are running green and yellow and blue. And the, the people have really started to, to dig their heels in and say, we need clean water. So the Chinese have started to clamp down on these and uh, have really uh, uh, imposed some restrictions. And they've focused on consolidating the whole industry down to six companies now. 
uh, but it'll take time. They're not, they're not there yet, but um, when we talk about the price of rare earths, uh, I talked to a number of potential end user customers, and they said you have to compete and provide your product at the same price as the Chinese. No fugitive gas collection. This is, this is uh, turning uh, rare earth oxide into rare earth metal. Uh, that's a uh, graphite uh, electrode. No glasses. He actually has flip-flops or tennis shoes on if you, if you can get a good view of that. No safety equipment, no fire retardant equipment. So this is what we're competing against. And this is an actual picture that was taken at a plant by one of my guys that was on a tour over there. Uh, that fan is the ventilation. Okay. Uh, try and get away with that in health and safety standards uh, anywhere in the United States or e the EU, anywhere. Um, so they've got a, they, they recognize they have an issue and they've got a long ways to go, but it's about providing jobs first. Okay. So the goal of the Chinese government, and this is why, why things become critical, is we've now defined we've got, we've got one area, one country, providing all these materials, and uh, their goal has become the transfer of the uh, product manufacturing to China, and that's their unstated goal. In other words, we'll make the product, but we really don't want to sell it to you, so why don't you bring your facility over here and put it up and manufacture the, the end products here. So a number of the uh, rest, uh, rest of the world companies have moved manufacturing capability into China to stay competitive. Uh, an unsourced comment was that the Chinese government has to create 300 million middle class jobs in the next 10 years to avoid civil unrest. Uh, the advent of bringing Hong Kong and Shanghai back into China have opened up a lot of eyes as to um, the different standards of living and they're trying to equilibrate that base. But these high-tech manufacturing processes will require, that require rare earths will also require skilled workforce. And if we're going to impose work standards, uh, work environment standards, and, and environmental standards, prices will go up. Um, what China did in 2010-11 is they announced that they were putting a quota uh, system in place on exports as to how, how much would be produced and how much would be allowed to be exported. And then they introduced a two-tier pricing system. And the two-tier pricing system was if, if, um, if you're TDK and you have a plant in China and you need rare earths, we'll sell it to you at this price. If you're TDK and you want to buy that rare earth and you're located in Japan, we'll sell it to you at this price. And so there was, there was an enhancement uh, put in place to encourage people to bring their facilities to China. So as a consequence of that, the rare earth prices in, uh, uh, soared uh, in 2011 on the speculation of critical shortages. There was hoarding and stockpiling that ensued by middle traders. Uh, annual demand projections uh, showed large growth potential because of the uh, wind turbine, everybody going to alternative uh, energy. Uh, electric vehicles, everybody working toward uh, cleaning up uh, uh, the air, uh, solar power, uh, another one. And it was, it was such a boon in, in like, it started about 2008 and slowly crept up into 2009 and exploded in 10 and 11. In 2011, Technology Metals Research Group reported there were over 300 active rare earth projects worldwide being developed which was interesting because then the capital funding went crazy. All these analysts were making pr predictions and recommendations, and there was just a ton of money being handed out to these new startup companies. But the reality suggested that really, if you did the arithmetic on the production stats, again, it's a small industry, <coughs> that if you were going to create a market outside of China, there really was only room for four or five producing operations to meet that projected demand but everybody ignored it. It was good times. We were in a super cycle in commodities and uh, conferences abounded around the world in China uh, included. New companies were being formed monthly and some existing companies were transformed. They had, 
uh, were juniors who had been trying to you know, do tantalum and niobium and all of a sudden said, wow, we've got rare earths too. We're now a rare earth company. Okay? And uh, they were very successful in raising money. Strategic offtake agreements were being consummated between these uh, junior startup companies and uh, like Toyota, okay, who wanted those rare earths for their production lines. And so they were saying, once you get in production, we get the offtake, we, you know, we get 50% of your production and we get it at this guaranteed rate, here's $100 million. Okay? And it's interesting because a lot of these offtake agreements that were made with people, they didn't even know how they were going to process it yet. They hadn't even done the basic homework or a mine plan. So it was, it was really chaotic, but we were living in a good time. Oh, for those good times. And I, I, I made this final note down here at the bottom that all of the presentations when you go to these conferences, everybody was going to be in production in 2013 or 14. When I joined uh, Great Western Mineral Group and I went to met with one of our, our well, our biggest customer, Vacuum Schmelz, uh, part of the OM group out of Cleveland, and they're in Hanau, Germany, uh, the president of the company, Isley, said, so this is January 2013. When do we expect the first shipment? And I said, well, I think it's going to be about 2016, which was telling the truth, but not what they wanted to hear. But someone had to go tell them that it wasn't going to happen. But these, these were the kinds of promises that had been made at that time that uh, could never have been fulfilled. So there's a lot of reaction going on along, around the world. Uh, there's funding. In Canada, there's funding in the United States, private institutional equity, private equity. The government, our government said, hmm, kind of interesting, you know, a senator by the name of Murkowski out of Alaska was pounding the drum. We need a policy, and we've got some, but it's still more of a wait and see and monitor uh, policy. But the Japanese actually did something pretty smart. The Japanese are key in this. I went and I met with the Armed Services Committee people, I met with uh, Defense Logistics Agency, DOD, and being, going around with a lobbyist, and we would talk about the criticality, and they said, I don't understand. What, why, why are you concerned? And I said, well, these elements are critical, and China occupies and dominates. And they said, but we get our stuff from Japan, and the prices are low. Couldn't be better. But they, what they don't understand is where is Japan getting the raw resource that goes into making the alloy metal that makes the end product. And they, they still don't seem to be concerned about that, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but the Japanese were because all of a sudden the Japanese started raising hell about, well, you know that island off our coast and those waters, those are ours. And there was a showdown of, bumping of a frigate, a few things that went on. And so the Chinese cut off the Japanese supply of rare earths for a summer. And that, was in, that was, I think, 2010. And it really caused a stir. And so the Japanese said, we don't want to be in this position. So they earmarked a large amount of money for resource development and R&D uh, to secure the future supply of, uh, to, of these materials to Japanese corporations. They assigned a large portion of it, 573 million to research development, funding mine development, funding uh, additional resource outside of China. But they earmarked a significantly bigger percentage of that for R&D, for reduction, optimization of what they used in rare earths, and elimination, you know, and so reduction of the consumption of rare earths, but also are there alternatives? Are there ways we can eliminate uh, rare earths in these end products. Some you can, some you can't. And they also funded rare earth cycling, recycling, looking at how we're going to get that material recycled back, which could be a big contributor. So where are we today in 2015? Actually, uh, everything has, as you know, the prices have slid down and uh, things have calmed down. Uh, and the production levels, a lot of the uh, panic didn't materialize. And today we see trio annual production levels that are returned to the 2009 level and lower. 
projections for 2015 were 150,000 tons, and actually this year, uh, just talking recently to a couple analysts, they think it's going to fall below 120,000 tons annual production um, and consumption. The, the prices for the rare earths have continued to slide since 2012, and today the neodymium oxide is, is selling for around 45 to 50. The spot market uh, uh, this week was showing about 39 to 40. Uh, Dysprosium, 200 to 210. So let's, let's put that in perspective. Neodymium oxide had reached heights of 175 to 200 dollars a kilo back in 2011. That's when we had the big spike in the prices. It was phenomenal. Dysprosium was up to 3,000 dollars a kilo. You can imagine why there was hoarding and panic and, and whatnot going on. And terbium actually went over, I think, $4,500 a kilo. Okay? Um, since that time, today, the Chinese uh, this year dropped their quotas. They got slapped on the wrist by the WTO. Um, and the prices were, were said, well, once that happens, the prices will go back up. Well, they've continued. They had a little bump, and now they've continued to fall. And just in November, they announced that the goal that they had set for production output, they're going to miss that by 10 to 15 percent. They're hoping for 10, but in, in fact, what they're doing is they're dialing down the plants because the demand's gone. They're blaming this on the illegal export production that they say is being smuggled out of China uh, into Southeast Asia. But if you do the math, I don't think they moved that much material during the Vietnam War between China and North Vietnam and South Vietnam. Um, it, it doesn't add up. Now, uh, Dudley Kings North and uh, Jack Lifton firmly believe that's the case, but uh, in speaking with a couple of other analysts, we believe that there's something else going on. Um, part of this is to blame is that, is that China is not willing to provide secure supply. A secure, they won't guarantee the supply. And, uh, and the reason for that is they're afraid they're going to miss the next 2011. So if we look at RE, the rare earth projects and operations and where we're at today, um, again, as I stated, Molly Corp declared bankruptcy with over $2 billion in debt. I think it was actually higher than that, but I'll keep it on the safe side. And uh, Mountain Pass was returned to care and maintenance and the assets are being put up for sale. Um, that doesn't look like that's going to start back up anytime soon. Uh, Linus has improved slightly, they've straightened out, they've got a new CEO and she has uh, done a, a very good job of at least getting the plant running smoothly, overcoming a number of the problems they had in Malaysia with permitting and uh, uh, their image and uh, they hope to be profitable. Uh, but they're also looking to merge assets, which means they're still struggling, okay? They're holding their own and I think their stock's about six cents a share. And they have a, a huge amount of debt. Uh, just as an example, the company that I told you I was working for declared bankruptcy. Uh, we couldn't uh, restructure our debt. We couldn't get anybody to fund. We couldn't get any cap capital money to uh, restructure our debt. And so uh, we had to uh, uh, declare bankruptcy and, and the assets have been sold off since. Um, this year has been a very tough year, it doesn't matter what business you're in, for raising capital monies. Uh, but rare earths even more so because of this, this I'll call it a knee-jerk reaction that occurred and, uh, and there was a lot of money lost. So uh, the other, other uh, indications of this are <clears throat> there, there are a couple of large companies like Frontier and Avalon, and I say large, they're projects, but they had large potential. They've delisted from the Toronto Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange. Most all of these companies are going into wait and see mode. Um, and capital fundraising this year has just been non-existent. Probably less than $100 million in the, in the rare earth space. And people are bragging about raising $800,000 or $900,000 on a new IPO. So not like the times we had previously. And all of these projects are now extending their timelines out saying we'll be in operation in 2018 to 2020. Another thing that's happened that we think is driving this reduction in consumption that, that causes these prices to fall is the wind turbine drives have always been direct drive uh, with permanent magnets. And now we're seeing a conversion to SEMA 
which means segmented electromagnetic arrays. Okay, and I'm not, electro, I'm not an electrophysicist, but it's a, it was a technology that existed that wasn't quite ready for prime time that had been uh, brought along uh, and was developing, but this is where some of the money from the Japanese funding of R&D went, which has helped advance that technology and bring it into actual use. And uh, my analyst friend said that this is where the wind turbines are going. And in the past, it was too expensive and it wasn't as efficient. And now they can actually, they've improved it to the point where they can turn it at a slower speed and, um, and maintain a longer life and higher efficiency in these wind turbine generations. This will have an impact and it'll roll down in other areas such as electric vehicles, EV, electric vehicles or hybrids. Um, the alternatives to rare earths are still being pursued in, in uh, R&D and we're seeing a reduction in, in consumption and improved efficiencies in alloys, but also recycling is playing a role in that as well. <coughs> China is going to, con will continue, as far as the future goes, what I see is China will continue to dominate and they'll promote uh, their rare earth usage. I'm starting to see, we're starting to see them come out and want to do Western style marketing by putting new companies in the you know, United States, Canada to promote their products so that they can maintain this. And what's important to them is those 300 million jobs. They want to maintain control of that manufacturing. They want to maintain control of those products and provide those jobs for their people. That's very important to them. Um, and we'll continue to compete. And I think what we've done is we've seen that R&D can help level that playing field by continuing to uh, make sure they're not the only game in town. Um, well, they'll continue to attract companies to China. They're going to improve their standards in the workplace and the environment, but their costs will go up, which should give us an edge. Um, R&D will continue uh, to seek substitutes and alternatives, and I think this is a really critical area where the United States has started to see some of that in DOE and the, the DOD, uh, Department of Army and whatnot. That needs to continue because that's what will keep the playing field level and it will also enhance our, our ability and our knowledges. Um, projects uh, that, if there's any projects that will survive, they will have to have extremely low capital and operating costs and be very efficient. The market now today probably has room only for two or three new uh, producers and uh, the market's going to be, the capital market is going to be very cautious about investing money in a rare earth company. They'll, they'll put it into an iron ore, a copper, or a gold company long before they'll do a rare earth company. It's, it's now viewed as extremely high risk. Uh, and the reason for that is billions of investment dollars were lost in 2011 in this knee jerk, and I'll call it a knee jerk because the prices spiked just vertically in that time frame. Um, technology improvements in the rare earth processing separation are still required to be competitive and there's still a lot of low-hanging fruit out there if we can get the funding uh, to do the work uh, to advance the technology. And there's, there are some new technologies out there being looked, le looked at in terms of molecular recognition uh, materials, um, uh, ion exchange, uh, high selective uh, ion exchange resins and things of this sort. But to me that's that what needs to continue to happen. Governments, our government in particular, is going to be reluctant to create subsidized production of rare earths. They're not going to do it. Um, and, and, you know, there's been talk about having a centralized facility where you could put up a, you know, you could create a rare earth mine and you could bring your material there to be separated. Not going to happen. Uh, governments are going to continue to monitor this situation and there's going to be a lot of politics and backroom deals. and. I think they feel they can work through the WTO. We'll see. Um, new applications will continue to be discovered and there may be a, and this will help create a balance between those applications and alternatives dependent on pricing, but uh, recycling is definitely going to continue to play a very important role. If you think of it, there's 125 magnets somewhere in that car and quite frankly today it's not worth it. It's not economical to go in and pull those magnets out. I mean, they're in the seats, they're everywhere, and how do you rip that out and how do you recover them, okay? So there's a lot of work being looked at, and it's just easier to take the whole cart, smash it, and take it off to the, to the scrapyard. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done there. 
In conclusion, I, I like to think that what, we, what we're seeing is innovation in R&D. If we're funded to do research and development with the innovative minds of, and capabilities we have, uh, we can continue to drive the supply and demand. We can keep that playing field level. These elements, it doesn't make criticality go away. They are still critical. We have no working minds in the United States. There are no working minds of rare earths in Canada. It's all, it's all China, okay? Uh, there's, one in, there's one in Australia. And I think the other conclusion we have to take away is always have a plan B. And quite frankly, nobody had a plan B before this. But the Japanese, I think, very effectively showed how you can make a plan B work. Now, that all said, the final statement I'll make is you got to beware of black swans, okay? And in the finance business, uh, I'm a metallurgical engineer, but there are a few words, buzzwords I picked up on uh, working around the finance types, and that's black swans. You can make all the predictions you want about what the market's going to do from here uh, to the end of the year and, and what it's, you know, what's the, what's the market going to do next year? And then you have a major event, such as the tragedy in Paris. ISIS, you know, global terrorism, some, some nasty event that occurs and everything changes. And so with that in mind, that's where strategic planning comes in. And that's where we need leaders that are going to be thinking about these critical what-if events that might happen and what would cause us to lose our supply. It could, uh, it could be a tough road for us if we don't have access to those materials. So with that, I'll close and thank you for your attention. Any questions? Yes, you know, there's, there's, there's so many different um, terms that, are, that have been used in this, where we get into rare metals versus rare earth metals, and, and we went through the technology metals and the minor metals, and critical metals, I think, cover probably uh, a whole host of things in your home, in your personal life, as well as national security, defense department, military, things like that. Um, whereas strategic metals, probably, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wager a guess, is probably going to drill down a little bit further and say those are what the country really needs. And they differentiate differently in political terms. Well, that's, and I'm getting to the, the politics of the matter and, and uh, uh, you know, if you need them for the defense, uh, for security uh, items, and, and actually the government would go out and acquire those in order to produce the products they need over top of our iPhone or anything else. Is that kind of where you, you're yeah. going to? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it kind of drills down a little bit further, whereas the, the uh, uh, critical or kind of encompass the entire market. But one thing about our market is, I differentiate in the Western world versus, say, China or Russia, is that once this got put out into the public forum for use and research, now the military has things coming back to them. Now the government has things coming back to them on products that have been developed out in the public sector. And it's for the benefit of the public, but also it tends to benefit the government. Whereas what I saw for the time I lived in, uh, over in the former Soviet Union was none of the money put into development of these, these uh, critical items, materials uh, for military purposes, the space race, whatever, never made their way to the public. When you go to Uzbekistan in 1991 and you go like this to pull the Velcro to loosen your sleeve on your jacket, and the kids go, wow, what's that? Yeah, I mean, it really, uh, it, it's the simple things that were developed, Thinsulate, um, Velcro. I mean, it's the little things, the luxuries in life that we know and take for granted every day. All of that stuff never made it out into the public. It was not for the public. It was, it was state secret, okay? The Chinese have done a better job of enhancing their economy 
through manufacturing and being the low cost producer, everybody wants to put their plant over there. They so. are low cost producers, but by the same token, 2010, 2011, they tripled, quadrupled the price selling to South Korea, Japan, and wherever. Yeah. Well, they had a price for themselves. <laughs> yeah. And then they had a price for outside the country. Right. That's right. And that's because, yep, yeah, they were they were leaning on them because there were there were some spats, but also they they're trying to force more manufacturing. I mean, TDK, a Japanese company that we hope to do business with and we're in discussions with, just said uh, we're not taking all of our production out of Japan, but it's become so difficult to get material that we're going to put about a third of our production over in China. We're going to build some plants the over there. Is the plant in Western Australia right now as we talk. Yeah. And they also are going to be doing some building South Vietnam plant. Well, there's Linus, the mine is in, yeah. and they make their concentrate there, and then they ship it to Malaysia to their plant there, and they're actually separating uh, and selling product out of there. There's a small mom and pop operation in Vietnam that's doing some separation. Uh, we had talked to them as well, um, but they're they're pretty small. They they can't handle a whole lot of. Well, you can see what in Brazil, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and actually, monazite tends to be a little bit easier to process than the bastosite. Huh? Yeah, exactly. So we'll see where it goes to. It's a very comp. You know, it's a complex. It's a complex process. It's complex ore. You got 15 elements you're dealing with at one time. You know, and I was I was sitting there, you know, saying, "Boy, I'd like to go back to the days of working for Newmont, where I went to the, where I just went to the Johnson Matthew door and said, here's my door, right? give me my money,' you know, because you you talk to these guys with the projects and they go, "Boy, we're going to make this high grade product. What are you going to do with it? You're going to sell it to the Chinese. Yeah, there's nobody to sell it to. So there's nobody can separate it. There's nobody to sell it to. Your only your only potential customer." are the Chinese in today's world, which is interesting. And, and after, I don't know, seven, eight years of this hurry scurry, we're no further today than we were back then, quite frankly. And, uh, and there's been billions of dollars wasted by investors, private and institutional. The uh, the price is down, but the, the production's also down because the, the demand went down, and that's what the Chinese hope to shore up, and that's some of this alternative uh, alternatives that we're seeing. And quite frankly, the biggest price driver is the magnets. That's the biggest economic driver. Is, yeah, yeah, rare earth magnets. And, and if you can find a way around them or minimize them, then the demand goes down. So that's, that's what we've got to continue to do to keep the playing field level. Because Again, they've got 36% of the world's resource. Yeah, so, you the market, so. got a corner in the market. So, good for them. <laughs> Any other questions? South Dakota? So, Mark, maybe you mentioned it, but I, I read about a, a rare earth deposit in Nebraska, of all places. Yeah. Can you comment on that? I can. I can, John. Uh, thank you. And in the interest of full transparency, I'd like to say this has been the most fair and balanced presentation ever made between Montana and South Dakota because not only am I advisor on the Industrial Advisory Board of the Met Engineering Department here, but I sit on the Mining Department at South Dakota. So, you know, I'm, I'm amongst nothing but friends. John, that, that really isn't a rare earth deposit. I would call that a uh, maybe considered a more critical element deposit. It's a niobium deposit, and the, what their hope is is to make a, uh, a ferro-niobium uh, product. They, they intend to mine it, extract it, and uh, concentrate it, and uh, process, uh, do the pyro processing right there and produce a ferro-niobium product. Um, that, that it, and it truly is in Nebraska, it's an underground mine, it's on a very, very steep structure. Um, starts, I think, about 500, you know, four, 350, 350, 400 feet below the surface and goes down quite a ways. Um, they think they have about 30 years of resource potential there. They're, they've done a, a PEA and they're working on a feasibility study. 
Um, my only concern is, is that the Brazilians control 85% of that market and they have 400 years of resource to mine. So all they have to do is take the dial and turn the dial up in order to produce more if demand goes up. So I'm not quite sure how Nile, I think it's Nile Corp uh, is the name of the company, and I'm not quite sure how they intend to, to, or why they think they can get a corner in that market, a piece of that market, uh, in order to, to um, uh, be successful. Um, I, it really, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't quite see it, but we'll see where it gets to. And and uh, the other 15 percent is uh, uh, Niobec out of uh, out of Quebec. And uh, Anglo has a small uh, deposit that they have the other seven and a half percent of that balance uh, that occurs in Brazil. So uh, it's it's not a rare earth deposit; it's a niobium deposit, and uh, we can call it a, a critical material if you want, but it's not a rare earth. So. Thank you. Yep. One, one follow-up question: What what do you see the future of Fountain Pass being? Um, not good. Um, they, uh, they had, you know, Molly Corp really went out, in my personal opinion, okay, uh, Molly Corp went out and really built a lot of excitement about their company, buying up other companies, Neo Materials, uh, the one in Estonia, the, the foundry in Estonia with metal making capability. Uh, there was some in investment or merger with a, a, a Chilean company. But I think they really overextended themselves. Uh, the stories I hear is that they've never really gotten that plant operating and fine-tuned the way they wanted it to. Uh, there's bags of lanthanum and cerium oxide laying all over the place, super sacks, uh, because there's no demand for it. Uh, if you want to talk about prices, uh, cerium and lanthanum in 2011 was about $65 to $70 a kilo, and today you can get it for about a buck sixty-five. So as I said, you know, when it, it has the majority of the distribution, it's going to be an oversupply. And so I think Molly Corp's got a very challenged future. Uh, I think what will happen is the bondholders who, who uh, uh, loan the money, the debtors, will sell the assets. Uh, they'll split the companies off and try and make as much money. Neo Materials will probably become uh, independent again, I, my suspicion. Uh, I know they're trying to sell the mine assets. So that doesn't speak too well for starting the mine back up. I think one of the problems with Mountain Pass is, is it's got a very, you know, the grade isn't bad. Uh, the trio grade isn't bad, but the distribution is not too good. One of the reasons I don't think a lot of people understand, they went to 20,000 ton um, production on trio, and they wanted to get to 40. And the reason for, and that's a lot of material, and it, they said it was their desire to be number one. They, they, this was the only company that the United States would need. The problem is their distribu distribution of neodymium is very low. And um, it's my opinion that they were trying to get the higher tonnage production throughput in order to get more neodymium. But in doing that, you've got huge amounts of lanthanum and cerium. And the cerium, and, and they do have a thorium content. Um, there is a way to get rid of the thorium uh, that we discovered, and uh, it has to do with taking the cerium out. The thorium tends to associate with the cerium, and you make the cerium a throwaway product very early in the process flow sheet, in one of the first steps. Um, the lanthanum still carries a little bit of radioactive material. The lanthanum to us was of no value either, and we actually uh, had designed in uh, a small SX circuit to pull the lanthanum out, and by doing so, we were pulling out the rest of the cerium and the other radioactive elements. One of the things you have to watch in rare earths that I discovered uh, when we talk about radioactive elements, we thought we had removed all the radioactive materials, and we were quite excited with our success. And we did all of our work at Mintech in uh, Johannesburg. And then someone said, what about actinium? I said, is that in the actinide series? And he said, good guess. And uh, 
I said, well, I'm not, I'm not read up on actinium, but actinium is actually a decay product, okay? So if you think you've gotten all the radioactive material out, what happens is it starts to degrade and the actinium, it becomes this decay product that shows up. Now it, its half-life is very short, but it still imposes a problem for you in transporting materials and classifying it as, as not radioactive because it will be radioactive. And sure enough, our materials started showing radioactivity and there's only, only a couple of places in the world that can, or you know, there, there's a, a number, a few places in the world where you can send it off for this analysis and ANSTO uh, is one of them, right? So you have to be very careful with that uh, when looking at radioactive materials and uh, controlling that. So, so I think Molycorp, unfortunately, I, I don't, I'm, I'm probably the guy that sees the glass half empty most of the time, so I don't see Molycorp Mountain Pass coming back. Uh, they've said the, the mine is not for sale, that they hope to reopen that, but I, in, in this market, it's not gonna happen, so, in this price market. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? If not, thank you for your attention. I, I, uh, I've enjoyed uh, seeing everybody, and thank you very much.